Welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. If you like this video, please let me know by subscribing to the channel or visiting my website to become a member for more exclusive content. In the, in the case of LPA, it's, we're, you know, we're very, very confident that, that we're using the, the, the correct uh, genetic instruments to infer a causal relationship between LPA and a wide range of uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular diseases. So to put a bow on that, we really have two independent types of analyses now that make it very clear that LP little a is playing a causal role in the development of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, independent of LDL, which you referred to earlier by commenting and using the term residual risk, which I think people might not appreciate residual risk, meaning what is the risk that remains in terms of ASCVD in the presence of LDL lowering? And of course, LP little a would be one such example. And those two pieces of information are now the regular observational epidemiology provided that the assays more accurately capture the measurement of LP little a. And now these Mendelian randomizations that effectively are nature's randomized experiments, provided those two criteria we discussed can be met. Is, is, that, is that a fair synthesis of the state of the, of the art today in terms of our understanding? Yes, I think you can also add a third assumption, which would be that uh, the effect of the variance on the outcome, so the effect of LPA uh, variance on cardiovascular disease are explained by higher LPA levels. And I think for LPA, it, it's, it's a fairly uh, fair assumption to make. Okay, so let's talk about how this is done clinically today. Um, most, I mean, the, over the past decade, I've seen three different types of commercial assays for measuring LP little a. Um, I don't believe two of them are in existence anymore. One was the LP little a cholesterol content. So I assume that this was an assay that was looking at the cholesterol content of the LP little a's, which means the LDLs that had apolipoprotein little a on them, you just measure the cholesterol content. So it was analogous to measuring LDL cholesterol but for this narrow subset. Is that assay still in existence? Uh, well, I think there are certain labs that, that still use it, okay. but it's really not the way that the, the, the field is moving to because uh, the cholesterol, and you can make the same, uh, uh, the same argument for LDL, the cholesterol within a certain lipoprotein uh, does not necessarily tell you a lot of information about the number of particles that are in the bloodstream, which is, the most important thing if you, to, to measure if you want to estimate risk. So for, for LDL, ApoB, there's some discordance, yep. uh, but for LPA, the, the discordance Just is enormous. even higher. Yep. Exactly. So, uh, so, so what you really want to do is uh, try to find a lab that will give you uh, an, an LPA measurement in, in nanomoles per, per liter. Right. Now, there are some labs that have done that. I, I've seen a lot of those labs. So one of them was called, um, God, Health Diagnostics Labs. Um, I think that was the name of the lab. They no longer exist. They did calculate an LP little a in nanomole per liter. I don't know what their methodology was. Most labs are using milligrams per deciliter. So they are simply telling you, I say simply, <laughs> they are telling you the mass of LP little a. Now, just to be clear, are we in that assay looking at the mass of the entire LP little a, or are they just trying to estimate the mass of the apolipoprotein little a's? It's the mass of the, the, of the particle. particles. So, so it's a, a much better measurement than LPA cholesterol that you, that you just referred to. So, uh, and, and we shouldn't you know, uh, let uh, good be the enemy of perfect here. If you have an LPA measurement in milligrams per deciliter, and it puts you in a high risk range. So let's say you're, you're, it, it gives you an LPA level of above 50. Uh, then the chances of the uh, LPA assay that's, uh, that will give you a result in, in nanomoles per liter it will also give you a high, uh, a high level. So if you have uh, uh, an LPA uh, measured in milligrams per deciliter, you can obviously try to get a second measurement in, in nanomoles per liter. But you know, if you have a, a, LPA, a LPA in a high range, it'll, both methods will give you uh, the, the, 
the, the same information that you have an LPA in the in the higher range. Now, you have to keep in mind, though, that if you have an LPA, for instance, of 50 milligrams per deciliter, the measurement in nanomoles per liter will be around 125 nanomoles per liter. So some some people have measurements uh, using both methods and they just say, well, for some reason, my LPA doubled. Well, that's not the case. The LPA didn't double and, and it's remarkably stable uh, over time. So uh, most guidelines will probably tell you just to measure LPA once in a lifetime and it's relatively, uh, relatively stable. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the take home point here is unlike LDL and ApoB, which are so modifiable, and therefore, it really matters that you know what you're measuring because you're going to be measuring it over and over and over and over again. With LP little a, at this point in time, and this is going to be changing, but at this point in time, it's basically something we measure to determine risk, after which point we don't really need to measure it. We've established risk, and now we need to take measures elsewhere. Uh -huh.